The U.S. is making the fight to save the planet a priority. While Donald Trump was skeptical about climate change, President-elect Joe Biden sees it as critical. He's appointed the first presidential climate envoy. How will that affect global ambitions to tackle the crisis? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Bernard Smith. The climate change is an urgent national security issue, says Joe Biden's transition team. So he's given John Kerry a seat on the National Security Council to drive home his commitment to the environment. The former Secretary of State has been sharply critical of Donald Trump's dismantling of climate policies. He'll now join a national security team that Biden says is ready to lead the world, not retreat from it. John Kerry was a leading architect of the 2015 Paris Agreement, which the president-elect has pledged to rejoin as soon as he enters the White House. Mr. President-elect, you've put forward a bold, transformative climate plan. But you've also underscored that no country alone can solve this challenge. Even the United States, for all of our industrial strength, is responsible for only 13% of global commissions. To end this crisis, the whole world must come together. You're right to rejoin Paris on day one. And you're right to recognize that Paris alone is not enough. President Donald Trump pulled the US out of the Paris Climate Agreement in 2017. He considered the pact a disaster and said the cost to meet its goals would harm the US economy. The accord commits nations to reducing greenhouse gas emissions to curb global warming. The US, the world's second largest emitter, pledged to reduce levels by about 25% by 2025. But Biden is now targeting net zero emissions by 2050 and has pledged $2 trillion to boost the use of clean energy over four years. Let's bring in our guests. Bill McKibben is the Schumann Distinguished Scholar at Middlebury College and leader of the climate campaign group 350.org. He joins us from Ripton in Vermont. From London, we're joined by Nick Maybe, Chief Executive of the climate change think tank E3G. And in Detroit, we have Michael Dorsey, co-founder of the Sunrise Movement and former EPA National Advisory Committee member during the Obama administration. Welcome to you all. Uh, Michael, first of all, Joe Biden wants to put climate change on the agenda in the Situation Room. What effect will that have on getting the global community to in intensify the battle against climate change? Putting climate change on the Situation Room, as you say, is critically important for welfare in the United States as well as global welfare. It's essential that we get back into these talks and lead them, just as uh, Special Envoy Kerry mentioned, not just for Paris alone, because that's not enough, but really to delivering on high ambition in the future. That means building out more renewable energy. That means tackling the unfolding climate crisis, as it were. So it's absolutely critical that we get climate change square on in the multilateral conversation, and the U.S. play a big role in that. Bill, after four years of the Trump administration, will it make a, a big difference globally to having uh, somebody like John Kerry, as, as uh, Joe Biden says, in the Situation Room? Yeah, I think it will. The, um, the great, one of the great shames of the Trump administration was that the country that had dumped more carbon into the atmosphere than any other was also the only country in the world not participating in the global process to do something about climate change. But as Michael said, I think the key remark that Kerry made was that we need to go beyond Paris. We know that the agreement as it's written doesn't take us far enough to really much slow down the pace of global warming. It's a beginning, but Kerry, who was there when it was written, understood from the start that it was a beginning, if that. And so the need quickly to push on to higher ambition, I'm sure he's aiming already for the next conference of the parties that'll be a year from now in Glasgow and a real opportunity for nations to ratchet up their commitment to climate action. 
Nick, do you think this appointment of, of Kerry will do that, will ratchet up the campaign to tackle the climate crisis? Well, it's from the outside, John Kerry is a great appointment and the, particularly his position in the NSC gives us hope that the US will be rather more joined up on climate policy at the heart of its foreign policy than we've seen to date, because as the others have said, um, it's not just about the UN climate agreement. We need climate to be um, a golden thread through the World Bank, the IMF, trade talks, um, high level geopolitics with China. So that's critical. I think for the rest of the world that's been getting on with delivering Paris for the next four years, um, they want to see a US that comes back into the fold, but perhaps as, as part of a leadership group, um, not as a leader on its own. Um, everybody is comfortable with the Paris Agreement as a framework inside which we increase ambition. Um, no one's looking to renegotiate Paris. The real focus of the next year, led by the UK and Italy, is to get countries to commit to more, which was what they promised in Paris, and actually what we're seeing around the world, countries, even China, stepping up with higher ambition. Michael, you were at those Paris uh, negotiations in, in the US green zone. I know you've said before that perhaps the agreement lacked teeth and we've just touched on that. So do you think Kerry is the right appointment here, considering, uh, I mean, he's a veteran diplomat, so he has the gravitas, but is he the right man to take this forward? You know, I think he's clearly uh, a skilled diplomat. Uh, I think we're going to have to wait and see uh, what uh, younger uh, you know, skilled diplomats he brings on his team. We've got big structural problems in the Paris Agreement, so we've got to get beyond it. The agreement lacked you know, adequate reduction commitments, it lacked an accountability system, it lacked uh, commitments on climate debt, it lacked guarantees for, for green climate financing and so forth. So that stuff has got to be chucked and we've got to move forward with something much more ambitious. And so we've got to wait and see who he puts on his team to get this done. It's going to be critical that we get a, a younger generation really thinking about, uh, you know, the reality of new renewable pricing. When Kerry was doing this, the prices were what I think you can call in the solar Jurassic period, the, the wind Jurassic period. They were 80, 90 percent higher than they are today. We can do much, much more, much faster uh, to deliver really well ahead of any kind of 2050 ambitions. We can begin to tackle this problem in crisis, you know, out at 2025, 2030 for sure. And we need to really push on that. So we're going to have to wait and see who he puts on his team. Uh, Bill, John Kerry certainly has the contacts. He's well known internationally, but is he, as you, the right person to move this forward to build on Paris? Does it depend on who he has working with him? I guess. Well, just as Joe Biden has said he plans to be a transitional figure in the presidency, I think it's pretty clear that John Kerry will have to be a transitional figure in climate diplomacy. The hope is to get us set for the next. 10, 15, 20 years. Michael's absolutely right. Talking about 2050 at this point doesn't get us very far. The key questions are about 2030. And that means Kerry putting in place a team internationally. And then the domestic climate czar, who Biden has promised to name in the next week, doing the same thing internally in the US. Between the two of them, that's a lot of firepower. And it may be enough to really get the US off the dime and moving in a new direction. Nick, just a quick reminder for us, please, on, on some of the practicalities of what Paris is supposed to achieve. One of those is to keep, keep global temperature rises below 2 degrees C, ideally no, no more than 1.5 degrees. Just for, for people to understand, if the temperature rises are kept to about 1.5 degrees C, what does that mean? What difference does that make? Well, basically, the new science, and we expect uh, actually even more science next year to confirm this, once you start going above one and a half degree C, you're in real risk of hitting irreversible tipping points in the Earth's system, whether that's Arctic sea ice, coral reefs, the Amazon. And that means we get damage which runs away with itself. So we still can control the planet, but less than we could before. So to avoid that high danger zone of irreversible um, catastrophic change, we need to keep temperatures as low as possible um, as to the 1.5 degree threshold. There is no place of no risk, but this is all about managing and keeping risk as low as possible. Um, but to respond to the others, I think, um, again, you know, the world has moved on while Trump has been in power. We've launched a huge amount of new ambition. Europe will agree a 2030 target. Hopefully in December, the UK will, has got its legislation in place and will announce more in the next few days. Um, similar New Zealand, Australia, Canada. Um, the US needs to show its 2030 target before it can kind of push others to move forward. So again, 
the world is looking for the US constraints of the Senate understood by everybody, mm -hmm. um, Georgia understood by everybody to really show it's doing its domestic hard yards and join in the international effort. And I do kind of warn my, my fellow climate activists in the US, please don't come out thinking you're gonna redesign the Paris Agreement. Um, people have been working within it. We've been working around it through the multilateral development banks, the IMF, the central banks. We've done an awful lot of work. We don't want to have an argument about the framework. We want to have an argument about ambition and about delivery. Um, and the US, we want the US to join that argument, but we don't want to. And the US, UK, as president of COP, does not want a big argument about rules and structures. In Glasgow, they want an argument about action and delivery. Michael, you don't want an argument about rules and structures, do you? You want an argument about delivery. No one in the U.S. is having an argument about uh, the old, uh, you know, five-year-old agreement. What we're really committed to is delivering for the future, uh, making sure that we deliver for welfare domestically and certainly globally, and really increasing ambition. That's really not an argument. That's a discussion that we, we're having here, despite the fact that the outgoing president wasn't having that discussion. Many people in civil society, many people in business are not just having that conversation and have been having it over the past four years, but they continue to actually deliver on this. Companies are now committing real resources, financial resources, structural resources to tackle this problem. Civil society is moving this. Lots of groups are leading on this. So it's not really going to be an argument. There's really going to be the U.S. coming in and leading by walking the talk, as it were. OK. Uh, Bill, does bringing that, uh, bringing that 1.5 degree C limit, does Biden, sorry, rejoining the Paris Accord, bring that 1.5 degree C limit within striking distance now? Many people have given up on it before. Well, I mean, the, the true, true answer is we don't know. There's a lot of momentum in the physics of this situation now. We've watched around the world this year from the fires in Australia to the fires in California to the fires in South America the, to the 30 plus hurricanes in the Atlantic basin. We, we're seeing change at a scale we haven't seen before. And what it underlines is the need to move with true aggression to true speed. Winning slowly on climate change is just another way of losing. So at this point, civil society, uh, uh, those of us in the activist world are primed to push and push really, really hard. There's no room for complacency among our officials. And, and Bill, I wanted to ask you as well, do you, do you, is moving towards a cleaner energy economy an easier sell now than it was 15 to 20 years ago? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, look, <laughs> 15 or 20 years ago, solar power or wind power was an expensive uh, and somewhat fringe technology. Now it's the cheapest way to generate power around the world. We'd be fools not to do it. We're going to move in that direction. But if we just go at the pace that economics dictates, we won't get there fast enough. We'll have a solar powered but broken planet. So the job of everybody is to speed up that transition mightily. And that means pushing not just on Washington, not just on governments around the world. It means pushing hard on Wall Street and on financial markets around the world. I think that's one place where the Biden administration is going to make a big difference. It's going to be easier for those those of us who are pushing hard on the banks and asset managers and insurance companies to find some real leverage. Uh, Nick, people can see and feel climate change getting worse, can't they? 2020 uh, set to be one of the hottest years on record. So is there a, a greater appreciation, at least, that there is a climate crisis facing us practically? Yeah, and there's been global polling recently that's held up during COVID, just showing that even in oil-rich countries, people are highly concerned about climate change um, because they can see it and feel it. Um, and I totally agree with Bill. This is about moving faster than the economics. We've won the opportunity agenda. we won that this is the economic economy of the future, even in China. The question is how fast we go there because that's what determines our climate risk. So some of the things the world is looking for the US to do now is to stop all funding of fossil fuels through their export finance. Um, the US International um, Investment Corporation. Um, the European Investment Bank, the world's largest public bank, has is going to phase out fossil fuel funding next year. Um, it wants to lead an alliance of fossil fuel free public banks across the world. We want the US in that. We want the US using its seat at the World Bank to stop the World Bank funding any projects. The first things we can do, stop fueling the problem and divert those funds to building the clean economy. And the US president has lots of levers. He doesn't need the Senate to... Um, so ask permission of the Senate to get going on that immediately on day one. 
Michael, two-thirds of Americans, including a majority of Republicans, say they want the government to do more on climate change. But then the Republicans are more interested in capturing carbon from coal-fired plants, expanding nuclear energy. Biden wants to phase out fossil-fueled, uh, powered electricity. So how do you, in a divided Congress, bring those two differing views of controlling climate change together? Well, a few wayward Republicans, laggards, as they would be called, uh, aren't really leading on this issue. The smart money has already decided that renewable energy is the cheapest way to produce energy. You know, the thing about Paris is that was about billions of watts of renewable energy. Tomorrow and even today are really about trillions of watts of renewable energy because indeed solar and wind are now the cheapest ways of generating energy. And that's going to continue to be the case into the future. And so the business world has moved on from, you know, a few, uh, you know, non-consequential uh, Republican states folks, and they're really committing on this in a big way. Bill, what tools does President-elect Biden and John Kerry, I guess, have to pressure countries to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions to limit deforestation and, and to push the use of clean energy technology? What, uh, how can they twist arms? Well, I mean, the, the US is no longer, Washington's no longer the center of the world in the way that it was uh, even a decade or two ago, and that's probably for the better. Um, the job of the U.S. is not to go and twist arms around the world to get everybody to do what it wants. Its job is to be part of and an important part of a global coalition that's moving in the same direction. Uh, there are plenty of tools to take on real criminals like Bolsonaro in Brazil, who's you know trying to torch the Amazon, um, um, and people will have to go after those and go after them hard, but. The, the real job here is to make sure that everybody is moving together fast. We don't call it global warming for nothing. You can't solve it in one place and one place alone. Uh, Nick, what tools would you think a, a president would have in terms of trade deals or other international agreements to, to persuade laggards uh, to, t to increase their fight on, against climate change? Yeah, I think... Um... To be honest, that the most countries, I mean, there was a few rogues left, but most countries, it's more helping them go as fast as they can, because as the others have said, you know, this is good for your economy and you're not going to get foreign investment if you're building a dirty economy. So the finance is really important. Three things which the world kind of campaigns, which are the UK and others are launching for next year, we'd like to have the US in. Firstly, committing to... Um, ban internal combustion engines. The UK has just announced it's going to do it by 2030, others by 2035 or 2040. Um, if we just got California in that group um, with China, we could drive the global car market the right direction. So that's one. Secondly, um, being part of a discussion that the UK is building with countries who export big commodities like soy or palm oil to stop any imports of um, commodities which are driven by deforestation. We should be able to sew that up by COP26. Um, and as I said before, um, if we can get the money, the, especially the public banks, to uh, be in the right place and the U.S. to be there, um, that would be great too. So there are some, there are some coalitions already in the process of being formed that the U.S. could slot in brilliantly to put its whole muscle, diplomatic and financial and market, behind driving everything faster next year. Michael, President Trump cancelled or loosened nearly 100 rules and regulations on pollution in the air and water and the atmosphere. Now, you can clean up air and water sort of reasonably quickly, but it's not the same with greenhouse pollution, is it? So how long do those heat-trapping gases admitted as a, as, a loose, as a consequence of loosening regulation stay up in the air? How much damage has been done now? So one thing we know is that President-elect Biden is committed to broadly the idea of climate justice, environmental justice. That means he's going to really focus on picking someone to head the Environmental Protection Agency to tackle many of the problems that you identify. The reality, though, in terms of tackling greenhouse gas emissions, uh, that's going to have to see a big you know, injection of resources and capital, some government monies, to, to really accelerate the build-out of renewable technologies. Right now, worldwide, and this is true in the U.S., renewable technologies, uh, solar and wind production make up a really high single-digit percent of the, the, the mix of energy. That's got to get really, you know, two, three, four, five times higher than that. It's possible now in today's prices. So one of the big things that's going to drive the reduction of, of greenhouse gas emissions is the build-out of that 
green, new solar and wind technology. Uh, it's happening in the U.S. It's got to happen much faster. It's happening around the world because many countries are deciding, really, that they're not going to focus on and invest in that old 20th century dirty technology, that old fossil fuel technology. They're making big commitments uh, around the world, uh, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America. And that's also happening in the U.S. And that's going to be the key thing to build out of renewable energy, solar in particular, wind as well. Bill, those rules and regulations that were loosened by the Trump administration, has that left us with irreversible damage? Look, uh, the Trump administration robbed the world of the momentum that we had coming out of Paris. It was a big pothole in the road. And there's, we're going to have to work hard to get that kind of momentum back so we can get into the virtuous circle that Mike and Nick are describing, where things really start to move of their own accord. Um, the key part to keeping that happening is going to be lots of pressure from civil society. Movements have to keep increasing that pressure. And that's been the most important thing that's happened over the last 10 years alongside those advances in engineering. The rise of movements that have millions of people in the streets remains crucial to keeping this at the very top of the agenda because it's difficult. It takes Lots of focus, lots of commitment on our leaders who are always going to have day-to-day -day problems that are more uh, pressing that particular afternoon. That's why there has to be this just ongoing push from civil society every single day. Nick, uh, Britain's Prime Minister Boris Johnson has invited uh, Joe Biden to Glasgow uh, next year, this time next year. Is there a sort of a sigh of relief, uh, those that are concerned about the environment, that there is going to be a new new US leader there, that for the last four years, things have been left to drift? Um, of course, there's a lot of relief that we don't have to deal with the um, actually much more incompetent than we um, expected Trump fossil fuel diplomacy. Um, but yeah, the view from outside the US, to be honest, is not about drift. It's actually about huge momentum. We've had mm -hmm. you know, the Fridays for the Futures marches across Europe. XR, Extinction Rebellion in the UK, similar movements around the world. We've seen renewables, electric vehicles accelerate much faster than we thought. So um, there is actually Paris did deliver a huge amount of momentum. It's a shame the US was disconnected from that for a while, and it's great the US is back. The problem is, as the others have said, um, it's not enough momentum. And as Bill says, it, there's tough decisions. We've done the easy bits of decarbonisation. Now we're going to have to get in people's cars, their homes, their diet. You know, so we need to deepen and strengthen our social movements, expand them beyond the usual suspects. If we're going to keep people on side for what is a, a beneficial transformation, but it's a huge and disruptive transformation nonetheless. So, um, yeah, the getting up to the speed we need to get to is unprecedented in human history as a transformation. And that, so it's not a, we're lacking momentum. It's just we need to rise to the scale of the challenge because we can't negotiate with the planet. So, Michael, what are your ambitions for the UN climate conference, climate, climate change conference in Glasgow next year? Do you think there'll be a firming up of the Paris Accord now that uh, John Kerry is leading the Biden administration's environmental campaign? You know, I think there's at least three key things that we need in the, in the Glasgow agreement going forward, in addition to this broad idea of ramping up ambition. We've got to have, you know, adequate you know, reduction commitments for continuing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We also got to have an accountability system for all the countries involved to make sure that they stay on course and not just volunteer to stay on course. And then we've got to really commit resources, I think, to the, those in the global south to really deliver on this in a big, big way. It's going to take resources, money in particular. It's going to take real commitments on building out renewable energy. We're seeing a lot of that on the private sector side, but we're going to need governments to get behind that and to commit uh, not just to volunteer to do so. All right. Well, unfortunately, just as we've got so much more to talk about, we're out of time, I'm afraid. But thanks to all our guests, to Bill McKibben, to Nick Maybe, and to Michael Dorsey. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for more debate, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. And I am at Jazeera Bernard. From me, Bernard Smith, and the whole team here, bye for now.